morning. So we're, I want you guys to split up into two groups because this has to be interactive, otherwise everyone's going to fall asleep. Okay, so I need at least, those of you that have done FACO before, Sarah, you've got to be on one team and then whoever has the most experience after that has to be on the other team. Split up. Okay, so this is about machine settings. Uh, it is part of your BCSC book. And I think, how many of you guys got some questions on FACO machine settings last year on your OCAPs? You guys remember? A couple? No. Same question. Not a lot of questions, all right? Maybe two or three at the most? Yeah, like one or two. So there were at least like four or five. Four or five, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, I want you guys, let's see, this side of the room, Tina's team, I want you guys to look through those, those terms because we're going to discuss all those terms. And I want you guys to come up with definitions for that list. And then this side, it's probably your side, will come up with uh, definitions for the right column. I'm sorry, let's do it this way. Right. <laughs> Tina, you guys take tuning down to venting, and then Sroff's side, you take down cavitation to uh, stroke. Okay? So go ahead and discuss it for about 10 minutes, okay? Okay. And we'll yeah, kind of go over the like, definitions. I know all of those things. Right now. I want to make some copies. I'll be back in just a moment. So look through that list. All right, so let me pull up. I don't know. But I wonder if we should pull up BCSC. Does anyone want to pull it up? I have it right here. Chatters yeah. and I don't think it's And like discussing. I feel like you start to dig yourself in the Yes. Um, unless Tina knows all of this. No, I don't know all of this. Okay. So, all right. Yeah. Terminology is definitely not necessarily, but um, oh, wow. it's just like you're wasting yeah. energy. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, shoot. So, we got all the tough ones. Tis so, here, here are the ones that we can talk about first that are um, just sort of fun. Energy around the yeah, we can talk about the ones that I know. There are some basic terms on that right side. So, um, first thing would be you know, aspiration, which is essentially just your vacuum power. So that's the amount of vacuum power. How does that mean? It's like bouncing off, the particles bouncing off like this. So it's just like you don't have enough. Start with Vaco, or when you start with cataract surgery, first position on your foot pedal is just your uh, cycle, right? Like, but, like, it's down to position two. On and off, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how often is it on? Like what percentage is it on and off? Because it's actually Vaco power. But aspiration is super important because a lot of what you're doing. Um, FACO is not actually using FACO power, you're using aspiration to on, bring off, pieces on, to off. you. And then, or um, on. Like, you know, you've brought the piece to, and yeah. yeah. you are using occlusion mm -hmm. to move the pieces around. So that's one of the next ones. Yeah. So, and that process is not the followability. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that that movement of your Piece so I think that you'd be like sort of just yeah, fake them. Right 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 right. <laughs> what you're actually doing is you're going in, um, you're using your vacuum kind of on a piece yeah. until that piece either comes towards the tip or you bury into the frequency has to do with the tip and you itself, like the how tip fast it's moving by sort of burying your tip, and that way you can actually move that piece where you want it. So out of the bag, into it's the like interior. working together, right? safe to actually fake them at that point. So occlusion then is really important because if you don't fully occlude your tip, you're just gonna kinda nip away at little pieces of nucleus and other things, and you're never gonna really be able to just get the fluid coming in through the side. So you have the piece, piece where you can safely fake it. Okay. So the followability is specifically after it's already been Side ports. It's sort of movement. the movement while it's being occluded, while it's okay. in that process. Um, and then, um, interesting. Let's see now. I feel like we're sitting in cataracts and you're talking about each term necessarily, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you're just like, they're like, oh. um, I feel like tuning, they must be referring tuning. to universal settings. Aspiration. Yeah, because yeah. they do yeah. tuning, like, during the. Well, it's I wonder just if that's. I, I'm not sure. I wonder yeah. if. Because yeah. you prime yeah. and tune the hand pieces. But, um, and that's like before you, 
but that's what the tax usually do for you. Actually, it has the free Well, so it's tomorrow. like the machine basically does it for you, but it essentially makes sure that everything's working properly, make sure that there's no air in the lines and all of that. But I don't know if that's what he's referring to with tuning. Let's see. Um, rise time is so once you um, occluded your tip into a piece of work over distance of cataract, whatever. The rise time is how fast that sort of um, inside of eye, I guess. Okay. Occluding power surges when you put it in the thing. They're all in this chapter. Um, and then surge occurs when you lose that occlusion. That? So I know this or stuff from actual like research. I don't know. They go up the piece. You sort of lose that tension. Stroke has All to of do a sudden, you get a surge, like which what, is sort what of the distance that your tip is back from. that causes your cheek like, to produce it. And this is just what it's. So surge is a very dangerous yeah. part. So you have longitudinal strokes. What they're really like trying to do with fluidics is machines is try and prevent surge. So you can imagine if you're like pulling, pulling, pulling on this piece, you're like building up vacuum, building up vacuum, building up vacuum, and then for some reason it breaks. All of a sudden you have a split second between where you can react and you stop that vacuum and where that break occurs. And all of a sudden things are gonna surge and your chamber is gonna shallow. And so, rise time in that. and so rise time is how, so rise time is how fast once you've had that occlusion, the, the occlusion uh, power surges after, essentially. Okay. It's like the time of the surge. Yeah. Well, so not the surge, but the yeah. occlusion. The surge is when that occlusion is broken. Yeah. Your bag sort of all of a sudden, because you still, there's a lag between where you, the pieces let go it's and you can stop your vacuum, it sort of yeah. breaks and all of a sudden the rise time is the time between the so, yeah, let's see what yeah I'm also confused exactly. about rise time which, yeah, which like what, section what you're measuring okay. yeah. so um, <coughs> let's see if there's a picture I think what you're describing makes sense but it's the period of time that's rise time that's not clear okay perfect let's see if we can is there a the rate at which vacuum builds Aspiration port has been included. Okay, so is that in, is that the, yeah that makes sense. So is that primarily controlled by your foot, like how strong you're pressing on the back? And how yeah, and, and your settings of the machine. <coughs> so your machine setting is going to be more aggressive into where. So once you occlude a piece, um, if you really quickly That's want to build, build so I would ask that how you need to turn to hold actually. that piece to your tip. You want to helpful to know how to set up the Faco machines. It's already attached. Uh huh. Um, you have to like prime to automatically build the vacuum and it's right here. It's the light fills as well. Which you need to like achieving an appropriate amount of suction and everything like that with aspiration. Yeah, you don't necessarily need a quick rise time, but but yeah. So, some more aggressive, sorry, go ahead. No more than like sort of the next thing goes. Yep. KFR's aspiration floor, right? Yeah. that are, I think, the ones that are more intuitive are easier to get. Um, Srov, on your guys' list, which one do you want to do first? Um, more 
more intuitive ones? Um, well, no, let's do the ones that are more esoteric a little bit. Do the one, just or pick any one from the list and we'll so go. So cavitation is one that we were talking about that um, maybe could be a little more esoteric because yeah. um, it's like you have distance between your tip and the piece that you're trying to fake go and there's yeah, like these like bubbles or micro bubbles that form there. They're not allowing you to directly touch the piece, and it's just like these high energy bubbles that are in the way for you to have good, maybe follow ability. In a sense. Does it help you? I mean, what's that? It doesn't that? help you. It's um, if it's if you're just if you're not actually occluding properly, it's probably not helping you. But I, mean, I don't understand that completely. Okay, so it, actually, cavitation is helpful. Okay. Um, you do need some cavitation for fake emulsification to occur. Um, so there's a pressure change that occurs at the tip. Okay? And when that pressure change occurs, you get these gas bubbles that expand and contract. Okay? But it's that collapse of the gas bubbles that releases energy, uh, that releases heat and pressure that allows you to emulsify the piece. So it's actually a good thing. That's what's happening at the phaco tip is some cavitation. Okay? And so this is my cheap version of the animation. Phaco tip vibrating, bubbles expanding, bubbles collapse, pieces break up. Okay? Heat. And pieces break apart. Okay? That's cavitation. Okay? So it's actually a good thing for you to have cavitation. Okay? All right, let's go back to the list again. Uh, team on your side. So they did cavitation first. What do you guys want to do? You can start, you can start at the top. Okay. Tuning. It's pretty basic. Your technician's doing this. Yeah. Okay. You guys never have to worry about this. This is the reason that we have software in there. And what you want to make sure is that what you tune in the machine is actually occurring at the tip, right? So you're going to get an error. If you don't plug in things correctly, you'll get a tuning error, okay? But your technicians are usually taking care of this. You guys rarely ever have to worry about this unless you've been on outreach with us and you're having to set up your machines yourself. Uh, then you're going to need to know that, hey, this, this is not tuned properly. What are some things that can go wrong, though, with tuning? So let's say you plugged in everything correctly. What's left in the whole system that could go wrong? Problems with your seals and your fluid exposed. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the tip is not attached as well. Tip is not attached as well. So those of you that have done FACO, you'll kind of your ear will become attuned to that buzz and what the buzz sounds like. And if you don't have the tip on properly, it'll chatter funny inside your hand. You'll feel it. It just doesn't vibrate properly, and it might vibrate at a different frequency. Worst case scenario, your machine will give you an error that there's a tuning problem. So what do you do? You come out of the eye, you tighten the tip again. And go through the whole tuning process again on the machine, okay? All right, uh, Tina, your side. Here we go again. Oh, um, Let's pick from your list. So we can do, yeah, aspiration. So the next okay. part of aspiration is just the actual vacuum power uh, that's like withdrawing fluid contents from your phaco tip. So it's that sort of pull out um, of the eye. So egress of fluid. So yeah. be careful about using the word vacuum, okay. though, okay? Sorry. So it is an aspirating force, okay? That's an actual attracting force that brings stuff to your tip. The way I remember is that A for aspiration is attraction. That's how you attract pieces to your tip, okay? So those of you that are on that last chip in FACO, we say don't go into the bag, okay? You don't need to go into the bag and actually go and touch the piece. Why? I want you to use aspiration flow rate, okay? And the way aspiration flow rate is, as soon as you press in position two, currents are now flowing into the eye because you already passed position one. Position one is irrigation. Position two is now actually sucking things into the tip, right? And that's what you're using is you're using the attraction force of the machine to bring pieces to your tip, okay? So that's why you can be just above the capsule, position two, and get that last chip out of the bag, okay? Assuming that it's free and it's not stuck in viscoelastic, or it's not stuck in the sulcus where you actually have to go and actually touch it to create some vacuum, okay? So we're gonna talk about a couple different types of pumps, but for your board's purposes, almost exclusively, except for a few machines on the market, our FACO machines are peristaltic pumps, okay? So if you ever look when they set up the machine, you'll hear rollers moving, okay? You guys should look inside the machine. Just before they punch the cassette in, you'll see a, a round mechanism that has maybe six or different seven rollers there. And that's basically that peristaltic pump that you see in your book. They'll give you a diagram. You guys remember that from your book? There's a diagram of that uh, peristaltic pump. Now, if you're going to go into retina, retina guys don't like peristaltic pumps, right? They want to have exclusive control of the vacuum, right? 
And the unique thing about a Venturi pump is that the vacuum rises independently of occlusion. Okay? And that's why retina guys like it. They want to bring vitreous immediately and chump it up, chomp it up, and let it go. Okay? They don't want to actually wait for things to come to the tip and wait for vacuum to build up. And that's why Venturi is for vitrectomy. So V for vitrectomy, Venturi, that's what they may test you out on your boards. Okay? Um, all right, next. This raw side, come on the list. Uh, or do you want to do something different? Power. That's something we're already discussing. Okay, power. Okay, so go ahead. What do you guys think about power? Without looking. <laughs> Sorry. We're talking about like work over distance. Um, so it has to do with you have you have the distance that your tip is traveling and how much energy it's pr uh, creating at that dis at that uh, the side of the tip. Okay. So the total amount you you'd calculate maybe at the end of the case is how much power was used, but it's not something we or is used, or is being used in a certain period of time. Right, right. So we, we, you would define a couple things that will define. You said stroke, I heard stroke, and then I heard you say power and energy, and that's exactly what we're doing on the machine. So when you guys program the power, remember our phaco needles move in two different ways. There's longitudinal, which moves in, in a coaxial fashion with the handpiece, and then there's non-longitudinal. On the Alcon machine, they call it torsional, and that's because the tip moves, instead of moving this way, it can also move this way. Okay. So that's a non-longitudinal um, um, stroke length. But this is the traditional way that we've talked about stroke length, this moving back and forth, back and forth. Now, the AMO machine moves in an ellipse fashion. So instead of moving just this way, it actually goes like this, and more of an ellipse, okay? But the Infinity uh, that you're using at the VA, the Centurion, you can program each of those independently, longitudinal as well as non-longitudinal or torsional, okay? Now, if you had a straight tip on the Alcon machine, what do you think, would, would there be any advantage of doing a non-longitudinal stroke? So straight tip on the needle. So you can move longitudinally this way, but would it make any sense to go this way? It's a straight tip, right? So that's why if you guys look at the tips, we traditionally use a, some kind of bent tip when we're using the Alcon machine. Why? With that tip bent like this, now you get more motion for that non-longitudinal action, okay? Instead of a straight tip, which would just do this and just kind of bury a hole, right? It's not going to be as helpful, okay? So when we're actually programming the power, we're actually programming how much of the stroke length we want to use, okay? Okay, Tina, your side. All right, so um, I guess we can go to... Should we just keep going down the list, yeah, guys? Think, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, so think followability. So. Okay, so before I put up the definition stuff, what, what do you guys tell me? What do you think about followability? So why is it important? Well, how would you define it? So I was less sure about this one, and we were less sure a little bit about followability, but um, thinking that it was most likely like the draw of your piece to the tip and sort of that that movement and um, how important that was, but. So the draw, we just talked about the draw, the attraction to the tip. What's that? What, what actually uh, controls that, that feature? Aspiration. Aspiration flow rate. Yeah. So the slower your aspiration flow rate, it's kind of what we call slow motion FACO, kind of beginner FACO. We don't want you guys to use a lot of aspiration flow rate. We want things to move slowly to the tip so you, don't, so you have time to react. So in case the iris or the capsule or some other structure comes to your tip, you have time to come off the pedal. So how would we get pieces to our tip fast, really fast? What would we do to the aspiration flow rate? We would increase it. So if you look, when you go to these FACO courses at Ascaris and you go to these uh, you know, breakfast meetings, et cetera, and you watch people showing their settings, they'll show off and say, oh, I use an aspiration flow rate of 60. That's impressive because it happens very fast, right? If you're an experienced surgeon and you know what to expect, yeah, you can probably get away with operating an aspiration flow rate of 40, 50, 60, okay? And you guys will get there. You guys will at least get to 40. Most of us have a 40 on our, on, our, on, our, on our settings, but it's fast, and that's what attracts pieces to the tip. So now, now that we've discussed that, what is actual followability, though? So you've already talked about attracting pieces to the tip. That's good. So then keeping them there. Keeping them there, right. So would it make sense if I'm, I'm fakoing a piece, and all of a sudden it just goes bing, bing, bing? Would that be helpful? No, it would be so inefficient 
and you guys would drive less nuts because you'd be going towards the bag, you'd be going towards the cornea, towards the angle, trying to get those pieces out, right? So chatter is, the, is a problem. We don't want chatter, so we talk about trying to optimize our settings so we don't get a lot of chatter during surgery. Um, or follow, we want, to have, we want to have good followability. And the opposite of followability, which we, I already defined, was kind of chatter. Pieces kind of pinging off and going away from your tip. So it's the ability of the phacal tip to attract and hold the piece at its um, tip, okay? Now, it's also impacted by something that we talked about, aspiration flow rate, right? So you have to have enough aspiration flow rate to keep pieces at the tip, or to continue to bring pieces to your tip, okay? And uh, the phaco stroke pattern is important. So this is why, part of the reason why non-longitudinal came into fashion, right? Because with this, can you imagine, you're pushing those pieces away every time you're kind of pushing them away, right? So if you did this motion, you probably have a better chance of keeping pieces, having better followability by not constantly pinging those pieces away from your tip, okay? All right, is Rob your side? Okay, you can talk about chatter. You talk about chatter, okay? Okay, what would you guys, let's do a cycle. What's that? Oh, yeah, How would you define duty cycle? We'll talk about duty cycle. So duty cycle is um, the amount of time that uh, the FACO is on when you're doing a um, yep. specific setting. Yep. So those of you that have done micropulse with me, that's the same concept. We're basically cutting the FACO power into packets so it's not constantly on. Now, what would be the advantage of lowering your duty cycle? We talked about this at M&M this year, this past year. For those of you that were at the m and M &M that I presented, I think it was maybe two, two M&Ms ago. We talked about a wound burn. Remember? Less FACO energy. Less FACO energy, right? So that would be important. So let's go duty cycle, pretty much everything we talked about. Duty cycle is on or off. You can control how often you want it on or off. Now on the machine, how do we do that? We do that through a couple different settings, okay, that you guys are gonna hear about, right? Continuous, that means what? Faco is on all the time. As soon as you're in position three, it stays on all the time. How about pulse? What would pulse be? On, off, on, off. On, off. Now, how about those packets of energy when they're on, off, on, off, and pulse, is that equal or not? They're equal. So the time on and the time off is going to, going to be consistent no matter how deep you are in position three, okay? Now, how about uh, the opposite of pulse? Not really the opposite of pulse. What's the other last setting that you can use to change your duty cycle? Burst. Burst. So what happens in burst? That's right, that's right. So, did you hear that? So the deeper you are in position three, which is your FACO setting, that duty cycle becomes closer and closer together, right? The energy packets are gonna come closer and closer together, okay? All right, good. Yeah. Uh, your side? Yeah, we'll do occlusion. Occlusion? Yeah. Okay, take a stab. Um, that's just when the, the piece of the lens comes in there or covers the tip of the FACA. Okay, so uh, yes, I will, 50% correct. It's not just lens material, it's anything. <laughs> Iris, capsule, vitreous, viscoelastic, anything that occludes the tip will cause occlusion. Make sense? Now, you guys always think about it as lens material because that's what we're trying to do, but it happens all the time. We talked about wound burn, okay? One of the issues that we had with wound burn on my case that we presented at M&M was that there was already occlusion before I had any lens material at the tip, right? How do you know that the machine is occluded? Those of you guys who have done FACO. What's your cue that you're occluded? If you have it programmed, you'll hear a bell, ding, ding, ding. That means your tip is occluded. What's the other way? Nothing's coming to the tip. It's Nothing's like coming to the tip, right? So it's basically just, it almost looks like stagnant water. There's no currents moving, nothing's coming to the tip, okay? Another, what's another one? A little bit more easy that your technician's gonna notice. You're not necessarily gonna turn over and look. It's on the screen. It's on the screen. It says occlusion. Ding, ding, ding. You'll see a red thing. I'm looking at it. You guys aren't, hopefully, okay? But occlusion, those are the three ways you can tell. Intuitively, inside the eye, it's stagnant. Number two, 
bell goes off. Number three, there's a red blinking light that shows occlusion during the echo. Okay? All right. So, we're, yeah, created by obstruction. We already talked about that. And then let's go back. Okay, Sarav, your side. One thing I wasn't so sure about was load. Um, load. But load is maybe like the actual material you're working with the whole time. I'm not sure. That's correct. Pretty basic. So that's why we want to chop pieces, right? <coughs> Chopping gives you smaller fragments to work with, smaller loads to work with. It's easier for the machine to actually emulsify a smaller load than a big load. Now, what are options when we would want to actually impale into a big load? Yeah, or what are, what, when would we want to actually? We want to pull a piece out, out of the bag, and, okay. and be able to work within a safe space in the AC rather than in the bag. Okay, and then, or if we want to chop it, right? So we want to go and actually grab a, a decent sized load, right? Because it would it make sense for you to grab a small load and pull it out of the bag and then chop it again? Not really, because it's already a small load. You just want to get that piece out of the bag and then safely emulsify it. So the times that we, when we want a large load, we're typically doing a chopping maneuver. We're trying to hold a piece. We're trying to bring a piece out of the bag. Okay? But eventually, you're wanting to work with smaller loads. You don't want to work with a large load uh, because that's going to require more energy. Okay? All right. Tina, your side. Rise time. Rise time. So. Uh, talk about this being the um, tie from occlusion, uh, I think where the vacuum or the I don't know vacuum or aspiration. I don't know which one power is increasing until suddenly uh, you lose that occlusion and reach surge. But I think rise time is before that surge. Okay, good. So you, you mentioned a couple things. You you mentioned aspiration flow rate. So rise time is very dependent on aspiration flow rate. Okay. So this is straight out of your book. Okay, I think you guys might have gotten this question. Do you guys recognize that diagram? Did that ever show up on your test at all? In the last, those of you that have taken it a couple times? Year. No? So if you look at the graph, okay, rise, you've got time on the x-axis, and then you've got vacuum on the y-axis. That's the critical piece. And now if you look at each of those, uh, those lines, they're all different colors to represent different aspiration flow rates that you have programmed. So look at what happens with the blue line. This is what we would consider kind of in a more advanced aspiration flow rate. It's fast, <coughs> 40 cc's per minute. Look at what happens to your vacuum. What, what happens? Really it's very rapid. Like less than one second, you're already maxed out at 400, okay? Now, what's something a little bit more? Mo let's go to the far right. A very slow aspiration flow rate, okay? 10, that's very slow. I don't even think you guys want to operate that slow. It is slow, like butter slow, like watching paint dry kind of slow, okay? This is not a good setting, but it's to illustrate to you, look how long it would take for you to actually develop enough vacuum to hold onto a piece and chop it. Four seconds, doesn't seem like a long time, but that's a long time in FACO standards, okay? So this would not be an appropriate setting for you to use um, to do a chopping maneuver, because you'd have to wait forever for the vacuum to rise. Now, is there a moment when you would want to use maybe 10, 15, where you wouldn't want the vacuum too high? Last piece. Last piece, Last piece maybe, yes. Or the what cortex, maybe. You wouldn't want it to go that fast. Or epinucleus is what I meant, not cortex, sorry. Uh, but this is, this is something that I want you guys to kind of <clears throat> bury in your mind about why this is so important, rise time. So on the machine, we can actually program the rise time to go up exponentially. So we don't do it a lot, but if you look at the Infinity machine, there's something that call, that's called dynamic rise time. It's a little tiny box that you can touch, and you can go into minus steps, or you can go into plus steps, okay? And all it really is, is it's basically either speeding up the aspiration flow rate, okay? The acceleration time, or decreasing it, okay? Depending on what step you're in. But most of the time, I would say on most of our settings, it's programmed at zero. We don't really want to manipulate that. We actually want to manipulate the aspiration flow rate itself, rather than trying to, you know, sit, looking at the machine and it says aspiration flow rate 40, but we reduce the dynamic rise time by minus four. It just doesn't make sense. It's just better for you to intuitively look at the machine, decrease your aspiration flow rate if you don't want the vacuum to rise too fast. Is the aspiration flow rate not, does it not 
control the pedal? Or is it just not enough? Like it doesn't. We'll go over that. Up, it is. You can control it. You can either. We're going to talk about something called fixed panel, okay, or surgeon control. Fixed panel means that on the machine you type in 40. As soon as you go into position two, you get 40 right away. Okay. If you do surgeon control, that means as soon as you get in position two, you start at zero or some other predetermined setting, and then it will go up to your maximum the deeper you go into position two. So it is customizable for certain steps, okay? But you don't always want to have uh, control or don't always need control of your aspiration flow rate, okay? Maybe you just want it to be 20 right from the get-go and keep it there and maintain it. Okay, Tina, your side, almost done. Surge. Kind of oh. Flows nicely in the surge. What's that? I love surge. Uh, love surge, yeah. Main of my research. Um, so surge is, so once you have this great big vacuum build as you're holding a piece, what... It, so you're it, occluded, let's say you're, you're occluded. occluded okay. and your, your vacuum's going up and you've okay. got this sort of great build and then for whatever reason, <laughs> it's the worst, that, that, that will break. So either you're a wuss like me and, and somehow you kind of let go or you break through a piece and all of a sudden you get this sort of rapid change in pressure because you've been building, 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 and then that breaks and there's some lag time between the, the kind of reaction of you to get off that vacuum and that piece breaking. And that can cause your chamber to really dynamically change in size, so rapidly shallowing, which can bring up a lot of problems. Um, and so what we're doing with all these fancy fluidics and the new machines is essentially trying to account for that rapid change and prevent the chamber from shallowing or a big kind of rapid pressure change. Um, and the new, the new machines actually are, like the Centurion is really, really nice. Um, there are fluidic sensors in the handpiece and in the machine to try and anticipate that sort of break in pressure vacuum change and keep your keep your chamber stable. There's also separate chamber stabilization um, software that's also trying to do the same. But the biggest problem that that gives us in surgery is that that bag or other things can kind of immediately come right up into your vago tip and you can get into big trouble with surge. So. Yes, so older surgeons who trained prior to vago understood surge more intuitively because we had to do manual aspiration, okay? So we used a syringe. Some of you have seen this device on outreach, or once in a while we use it here. Simcoe, have you guys seen the Simcoe in action yet? No? Okay, so Simcoe is basically a cannula. It has irrigation, gravity-fed irrigation, and it has vacuum or aspiration created by a syringe that's attached to your tubing. And all I'm doing is I'm pulling with my thumb, and I'm pulling to create that, that, that aspiration flow rate, occluding, and then the vacuum will start to rise. But if you're too aggressive with moving that plunger, like really hard, you're pulling on it, all of a sudden you slurp up that piece and you're still pulling back on the syringe, on the plunger, what happens is the chamber will just completely shallow up, okay? It's because you're pulling so hard, creating that vacuum, that suddenly, as soon as you break through and you're no longer occluded, it just dumps the entire anterior chamber into your tip because you're pulling so hard on the syringe. This is what we're trying to avoid in surgery. Now, what are some clues to surge in surgery? Those of you guys have done FACO, maybe you can give everyone a little bit of flavor about what you're looking for when you're in surgery uh, that may suggest that there's more surge. See the pattern. Shallowing of the chamber, right? Yeah. Okay, shallowing of the chamber. Instability, right? Like there's, the bag is coming up, maybe flapping a little bit. Um, the red reflex can change. Okay. Pupil winking, have you guys seen that? The pupil will just wink like this, okay, if there's a lot of surge propensity, not necessarily bad surge, okay, um, but you'll see the pupil wink, you'll see the chamber become unstable, the bag kind of just pulsates back and forth. Every time you clear your vacuum, every time you break your occlusion, everything's just starting to come shallower, okay? Now, a little bit of surge is okay, okay, as long as it's manageable, but if you've got, you know, a significant amount of surge, that's where it gets dangerous, and that's where we're going to have issues with popping the capsule, okay? So, let's see, piece came off, I was, I was under occlusion, and then I'm still aspirating, right? I'm still in position two and three, and boom, chamber dumps. And that's what happens during surge, and that's what you're trying to avoid. 
So on the new machine, there's actually <coughs> pressurized infusion. Okay, the Centurion doesn't have a hanging bag anymore. You guys may notice that if we still have the infinity by the time you do FACO, you'll notice it's different. We hang a bag and we rise the pole up. But when you're here at the Moran, where we only have Centurions, it actually goes into a container with two walls, and the walls actually come together and squeeze the bag, and that's why we use soft bags. When we're using the Infinity, we're using glass bottles still, right? But here, we're using that, that, that soft plastic bag to kind of squeeze um, together to actually pressurize infusion inside the eye. Okay, it's Rav. Correct. Okay. I, I doubt you'll get a question on this, but it's just more about you know, how FACO is working. There's actual crystal there that converts electrical energy into mechanical energy. Okay? So electricity comes in, causes the crystal to vibrate, your tip will vibrate then. Okay? All right. Tina, a couple more. Kind of hit on vacuum, okay. but I guess we could sort of visit that. So. So vacuum is important, and the reason it's important is because we want to actually hold on to pieces during surgery. And we actually, it's important because we also want to have good fallability. If our vacuum is too low, right, pieces will tend to go away, right, and we won't have good fallability. Now, um, you, this is an important principle, because we're going to talk about this a lot when you're in surgery, and that's that the vacuum, now this is in contrast to retina surgery, but the vacuum doesn't rise in FACO until you're occluded, okay? So one of the classic things that we'll talk about is cortex removal. You guys tend to grab the cortex pieces and then push on the pedal, right? Hoping that it's gonna be more efficient. But what you should think about first before you step deeper on the pedal is occluding the tip, okay? You want to grab the cortex almost stuff your mouth full, like just completely stuff your mouth full and occlude the tip, then depress the pedal to build the vacuum up, okay? But you guys tend to do this, and basically <laughs> ramp up the vacuum before the tip is occluded. And that should cause you alarm signs. That should make you shudder, okay? You don't want a lot of vacuum. It's not necessary. Those of you guys that have operated with me, you'll, you guys will complete all the cortex removal if you do it properly, at about max 250 vacuum, right? The machine is set to 450 under my settings, but I'm trying to teach you guys a principle during surgery. If you hear and it gets really, really high and nothing's happening, right? That's a setup for surge, okay? Because suddenly if the occlusion is broken, you're gonna grab the bag, you're gonna grab the iris. Uh, those are the reasons why we don't try to ramp up the vacuum by stepping deeper in the pedal until we're occluded. So you actually want to grab the cortex. We'll teach you this kind of tornado technique, right? And the purpose of the tornado is that you can get more cortex inside the aspiration tip. If you just grab one clock hour, you can do that. But as Alan will show you in his videos, every time you grab one clock hour of cortex and strip to the middle, you're creating a lot of stress in one focal area on the zonules. That's why you grab two or three clock hours and you distribute that, that, uh, that force over a larger area so it's a little bit gentler on the zonules, okay? But remember, vacuum doesn't change until you're occluded. So if I have this, I talk about this every year when I do this lecture or two years, big glass of water, and I've got a marble down at the bottom, and I'm gonna ask you to take it out with a straw. How are you gonna get that marble out of the bottom of the glass of water just using your mouth? Would you suck all the water out first, and then you're down to the bottom and have the marble? No, that would be totally inefficient. You would take the straw, you'd go down and actually create occlusion first, and then creates a negative suction in your mouth, and then take the marble out, right? That's why this is so important. We want you guys to occlude first, then the vacuum, you have control over the vacuum, and then we can get it to rise, okay? How does the machine control like aspiration flow rate and vacuum differently? Are they not the same process of... No. no, so vacuum, as we showed you on that diagram with the three, vacuum rise time increases faster if we have a faster aspiration flow rate, right? You do control the vacuum setting in terms of your max parameter, right? But the vacuum doesn't actually go up until you get occlusion. 
So vacuum's like only the negative pressure part of it. Yeah, it's that holding power, right? That's what we want. Remember, aspiration is just things coming to your tip, right? It could be water, it could be lens material, iris, capsule. It's just things coming to your tip. It's making that full circle, right? You've got irrigation coming in, now you've got to bring it to the tip, okay? And it's just that full cycle of irrigation, aspiration. But the actual holding power, like your regular vacuum or anything else, okay, or that suction cup when you put it onto a, uh, any, a solid surface, that holding power, that's the vacuum. Now, this is totally different in retina surgery. In retina surgery, if you ever watch the machine, those of you guys that are on the retina surface, I want you guys to look over at the machine when they're doing the vitrectomy. Look, what, look what's happening to the vacuum number. It's actually increasing, and it's not necessarily occluded. And that's the beauty of a Venturi system, okay, is that you can control vacuum in the system independent of occlusion, okay? And that's why retina guys like it, okay? They don't want to have to go and chase vitreous at the retina level. Otherwise, it might suck retina with you, right? They want to be able to just remove all the vitreous and do what they need to do and stay away from the retina, okay? And so they want to have exquisite control of vacuum, and that's why the Venturi pump does that. There's a few FACO machines on the market that actually have peristaltic and Venturi settings, and it's pretty amazing, I must tell you, because you can be, uh, during cortex removal, you can be almost in the center of the eye and press on the pedal, and the cortex just comes right to your tip. It's a little freaky, okay? And you could be hovering up high in the AC, and you could have a piece way down in the bag, and you could press on the pedal, and that piece just goes whoop, right up to your tip, and it happens very quick, okay? And why? Because uh, surgeons want to be quick. They want to get down with the case quick, and they may like to go in and out of peristaltic and venturi vacuum. But not to, most, most of our machines are just peristaltic for FACO. Okay? All right. Uh, who goes next? Start off your side. A couple more. Stroke? Yes, we can do stroke. Okay, so we, we talked about it a little bit when yeah. we talked about power. Yeah, but so. it's just that distance that we're traveling, right? So the stroke is the entire distance or whatever you set on your, on your machine. This is something that we don't change, okay? You guys don't change the power stroke. In I'm sorry, you don't change the stroke length at all. But what you do change is duty cycle, the time on, okay? And you change the power, okay? So when we have that hard, dense piece, it makes sense to use a longer stroke length to break up the pieces. You're creating more heat, more energy to break up those pieces, okay? All right, Tina, your side, last one. So we didn't get to talking to venting, and I think um, I could use some uh, information about venting. I know it, it has to do with the, like the equalization. That's it, that's pressure. it, yep. Um, exactly. But, yeah. So air is introduced into the tubing, which equalizes pressure with the atmosphere to minimize surge, okay? Machines taking care of this. You guys never have to worry about this. Just understand this is what engineers are programming to the machine, okay? In order to try, it's one more thing to, to, to prevent surge, okay? Surge is probably by far and away the thing we talk about the most because that's where we have complications. Okay, Srav, just a few things. We kind of talk. Yeah, about shadowing the frequency. Okay. So just the rate at which then, like, kilohertz at the which. Yeah, exactly. So your fecal needle moves back and forth during each stroke somewhere between 27,000 and 60,000 hertz, okay, kilo, or hertz, cycles per second. Okay, and then inflow, I'll just kind of go through these quickly. We already talked about this, the irrigation flow going into the eye, uh, nothing special, okay, and then load we talked about, and then I think there's chatter we also talked about. This is important though, so lens fragments are repelled off the tip. We don't want chatter, it makes it less efficient. And then you've got pieces down in the angle, in the sulcus, in the bag, and they're not staying with good fallibility at your tip, okay? So this is what happens during chatter. Needle moves, boom, pieces go away, okay? We don't want that um, chatter during surgery. Okay, now look at your handout, this last 10 minutes here, and I gave you two sheets uh, to look at. One, the second sheet is for you guys to go home and play with and write down what you would want for settings. You can go and study everybody else's settings. What I'm showing you on the first page is what my settings are, okay? And let's go through those, because I want you guys to look at some themes, okay? Let's say you were given a FACO machine on outreach and you had to program it, and your handy, trusty technician 
representative is no longer there with you. What are you going to do? You're going to have to figure this out. Everyone's going to look to you as a surgeon. Technicians aren't going to be able to do this. You, know, you guys have to do this on your own. So let's look at the first one, sculpting. In sculpting, what we're doing is we're just starting the case. We're just kind of gently removing that soft, fluffy stuff. Or maybe we're creating our trench, right? So when we're sculpting a piece, just like an ice sculptor, sculptor would do, do we actually want to have a lot of uh, vacuum? No. So look at the vacuum column and notice what you see there. What number do you see? 80. Now, the diagram is um, lines that are there for a reason. When you see a straight line, that means you're getting 80 all the time once you're occluded. Okay? So the straight line, that, that's also referred to as panel or fixed control. Right? You're not changing um, the amount of vacuum that occurs. You just want it to be constant as soon as you occlude. Right? So that's what the straight line means. If you see a diagonal line, that's surgeon control. Okay? And that means the deeper you step into that position, the more that setting you're going to get. So notice that the vacuum is 80, and then the aspiration flow rate is also, is it fixed or is it surgeon control? Fixed. It's fixed. Why? You know, you're not trying to attract pieces to your tip and sculpt. You're actually using the tip and actually moving it around and shaving, right? There's no reason to stay in the middle and get a piece to come to your tip, right? So if you want to think about this, I, you could have made this 20 and it wouldn't have changed anything. But the ratio is important, and it's basically 1 to 4, right? So aspiration flow rate, 20, and then times 4, you get 80 for your vacuum, okay? Now, uh, the IVH, that's infusion bottle height. Not as important now with the Centurion, but when you're at the VA, we're going to say go up on the bottle height or go down. Okay, so these are some general settings of the bottle height. Now the bottle height is also very important because it's dependent on where the patient's eye level is. Okay, if the patient, if you were operating on the floor, sitting Indian style, okay, and your bottle height was at 90 on the machine, you'd have a massive amount of fluid coming into the eye versus if you had it in a normal position. Does that make sense? So the infusion pressure when a gravity fed system is dependent on the eye level of the patient uh, relative to the bottle height on the machine, okay? So most of the time, the bed height doesn't move a lot. I mean, it does move a little bit depending on how tall you are and if you can get your legs underneath. But for the most part, it doesn't change a lot. So that's why we're changing the gravity pull and moving it up and down if we want more infusion. If we're losing our chamber, if things are getting shallow, that's one of the things we can do is we can increase the bottle height to push more fluid into the eye. Is there an accurate conversion between bottle height and IOP? You know, I haven't looked at it. Um, I don't know the conversion, but typically I will, I will tell you on the Centurion, when they first set it up for me, they were setting up an IOP infusion pressure of 70, uh, which retina guys do a lot. That's what they operate a lot. In my personal opinion, it's too high, okay? And there's a phenomenon that's been described a lot, and that's basically this um, um, intraoperative malignant glaucoma, okay? Or BSS misdirection. And what happens is when you're pressurizing all that fluid into the eye, it's got to go somewhere, right? Either you're aspirating it out. But if you're not aspirating, that fluid's going transonular, hydrating the vitreous, and then causing a lot of posterior pressure. So Boris Malugin had, I think he won the video last year at Asperger's. If you haven't seen it yet, it's great. He'll show pieces, lens fragments, that have gone transonular and are sitting in the hyaloid, anterior hyaloid. And why does that happen? Because of that pressurized infusion. Right? It's too high, and it's basically causing the, that fluid and little tiny lens fragments to go and sit behind. And you may think, oh, I'm going to go and grab those pieces when I'm polishing. And you think, oh, no, maybe those are just floaters. But in some cases, it's actually lens material. It's actually sitting in the anterior hyaloid because it's gone transonular, okay? Because of this problem with new infusion pressure uh, bottle heights or pressurized infusion systems. Personally, I operate at 40, okay? I think that's plenty of pressure. I have a lot of glaucoma patients. I don't want them to live at 70 during the case, even though we're coming in and out of the eye. Um, but I tend to operate at a 40 IOP on the Centurion, which is probably around 90 of infusion bottle height. I, there is a translation there. Like when you see the Centurion, you can either see IOP or you can see um, centimeters, right? To kind of give you that QO. This is, I used to operate at 90, so this is the pressure I want to operate on. But in general, I think the infusion pressure is too much on the Centurion. Okay, let's go down. Chop. So what do you notice about chop now? 
You've got infusion bottle height, we've increased that. The longitudinal FACO, I'm only using longitudinal FACO. And the reason I like to only use longitudinal FACO in the chop mode is that I want you guys to bury into the tip, into the lens piece, and that's it. All I want you to do is bury the tip and occlude it so that the vacuum will rise, right? So I don't necessarily want you guys to be super efficient and basically make a big cavity and then suddenly lose your occlusion, right? I want you to jackhammer, vacuum goes up and just, you'll hear that high pitch noise, meaning the vacuum is on, or I'm sorry, the occlusion is on. So your vacuum will then rise proportionally. And look what happens under vacuum. Is it fixed or is it surgeon control under vacuum for chop? fixed because what I want you to do is that as soon as you cavitate into that piece and you get occlusion I don't want you to have to step deeper in the pedal and try to hold it I want you to basically for the machine to top out at 400 and then for you to relax bring the piece to the center and then do your chopping maneuver right so that's why I personally like to have fixed vacuum for the chop mode right and you guys will notice the difference when you're with me if I have you operate in some of these settings where it's not fixed what you have to do is then impale into the piece, and then you actually have to step deep into position three just to hold the piece there. And sometimes too much is going on. You're thinking, oh, how am I gonna chop this? Am I gonna bring it out of the bag? It's one less thing for you guys to have to worry about once you're clued. So Rob, have you felt it? Have you noticed that? Yeah, like, you have the response right away, essentially. Yeah, as soon as it's on fixed panel control, as soon as you're occluded, boom, vacuum goes right up to 400, right? So you're not gonna have to step deeper to hold it. It's already going to occur as long as you're included. Okay. Now aspiration flow rate. Look and see what happens. I have it on surging control. It's a non-zero start. It starts at 10 and then it goes up to 40, which means this is your attraction force, right? Again, you, if, if that if that piece isn't coming quickly to your tip, you can step deeper into position two, control the speed of the aspiration flow rate, and then bring those pieces quicker to your tip, right? All right. Now let's go to quadrant mode and. Um, what do you notice about the vacuum in quadrant mode? It's fixed or linear? Surgeon control. Surgeon control, okay? And the reason for that is that once you've already chopped up the pieces and you're just hanging out in the center of the eye, I want you to be able to control how fast you emulsify the piece and that followability, right? If you don't need a ton of vacuum, then that allows you to just modulate with your foot. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and step deeper, create more vacuum, hold the piece, or let's say you wanna chop a piece, but you're in quadrant mode. So you can step deeper into position three and then do another chop if you need to. But I want you guys to be fully in control of how fast and how efficient the emulsification works. And that's why you see vacuum and aspiration flow rate have that diagonal, and it's under surge and control, okay? Now I have something under vacuum it's new this year that we've tried to program for everybody's setting, and that's the last chip vacuum, okay? Um, Srab is probably the only one that I've operated with so far that's used it. But what you're doing is you're trying to minimize the surge that happens on the last chip, okay? I wouldn't say all cases of back breakage are due to the last chip, but many are. You know, I, I, I pulled last year's seniors, and I would say 50% of the PCRs that we had last year were due to the last chip. Okay, you've done everything else, it's just that one last chip, right? And you're thinking, oh, this, I'm home free. Boom, right there, bag hits your tip, boom, bag breaks, right? And it happens so quickly, right? And in my experience, taking the vacuum threshold and putting it to 200 doesn't reduce the efficiency. All it does is it helps to maintain that chamber. Because now you don't have that 400 of negative suction as soon as the occlusion breaks, right? And just that simple maneuver of taking the the vacuum down to 200 uh, is now our last chip setting. So when you guys are in that in that in that position when you're doing FACO, if you feel like things are moving too fast and that bag is really dynamic, the iris is winking, you should go ahead and engage the last chip setting. It's uh, entitled flip at the VA. Okay? You'll go in the chop, quad, and then we have one more setting called flip. It's the same power, okay, it's using the same ultrasound energy as the quad, but the vacuum has been toned down to 200. So you will not be, even if you occlude the tip, you will not be able to exceed 200 on the, under the last chip setting. And I think that helps to protect you guys and keep things a little bit slower, okay? Do you think it's also, like, um, compared to like epinucleus, it's also like safer to use torsional power in that setting rather than longitudinal, or is it more efficient? So what I found, and this is my personal bias, 
Torsional is excellent. It's really good. Okay? And it's so good that if you get close to the capsule and just graze it, going like this, you will cut the bag. Okay? Versus if you're going like this with longitudinal, you can sometimes be lucky. You'll grab the bag and you'll let go quickly and you will not have broken the capsule. Okay? And that's because longitudinal phago is not as efficient as cutting, right? You may go and actually suck the capsule and then you let go, no breakage. But if you do this motion with the torsional, it's very good at cutting the bag. So personally, when I have you guys on epinucleus, I don't have any torsional power, okay? It's all longitudinal power, but it's, it's a lot lower. We're only using 40% duty cycle, only 10 pulses, right? It's pretty slow in control. But epinucleus is soft stuff, right? You don't need the efficiency of torsional phaco to remove soft epinuclear stuff, okay? All right, but uh, if you were to keep some ratios in your mind, you can basically remember um, it would be one to 10 for your chop and your quadrant, your vacuum and your aspir aspiration flow rates are gonna be roughly one to 10 in that uh, ratio if you had to program the machine from scratch, okay? And everything else just gets toned down. Epinucleus is less. Vacuum, polish, visco, these are all very straightforward settings. You don't control any power, obviously. All you're doing is controlling the aspiration flow rate and the vacuum. My personal bias is to have those on surgeon control so you can control how fast that vacuum is moving uh, during the cortex removal. Okay? Second page is for you guys. It's a blank sheet. You guys can go and customize your own settings, learn from other surgeons and what they're putting in. Uh, but that's just for you for the future. Whenever you guys start to kind of customize your settings, it's just a blank sheet for you. Okay. All right, questions?